first of all, I have to deal with this mic. And it adds to the pressure, I won't lie. So we're talking about Todd. And I'm checking my body now. Am I on? All right. To what do you want me to hang on to, David? <laughs> <laughs> Already nervous. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to keep talking. Keep talking. So, um, first of all, my name is Jim Stamberger, and I teach classes constantly. I stand in front of large groups of people constantly. And um, I impart my opinion and my information constantly. And I do it without ever raising my blood pressure. Blood pressure. I stand before you and I'm checking my body. My hands are sweaty. My blood pressure is rising. And I'm shaking all over. Uh, this is not the body that I think God expected for me. <laughs> but um, David said, I want you to be me. Or I, I want you to be you. And um, so that's what I'm going to do. When I originally took this assignment, I said, oh, I'll have plenty of time. And I've done theater in church forever. And I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll hide behind this really incredible drama performance. And I had it planned, and this, the stage was going to be a cathedral. And we were going to do a piece perhaps you've heard of from um, Esmeralda sings and uh, Quasimodo's on the stage and we're, we're doing God Help the Outcast and it's a beautiful piece. Well, first of all, I planned to have five days to rehearse that in. And I was going to get the Romani who worked for me at the Renaissance Festival to participate. Well, first of all, the Romani are really busy this year and they really didn't have the time to do it. And then the uh, people that I really counted on um, said, yeah, I'll do it, but they weren't the right people I needed to cast in the show. And I thought, well, I'll simplify it. It'll be great. You know, God says, we'll simplify it. And it'll still be incredible, and I'll say four or five words, and then I'll let the, the piece speak for itself. And then, coronation got moved. Coronation is an event that takes everything I've got, resource-wise, um, to put on, a, put on stage for the Renaissance Festival, and um, it is probably the most stressful thing that I do at the Renaissance Festival. And that happened the day before I'm supposed to stand before you and speak. Um, I think God is speaking to me. And sometimes I think God's saying, oh, this is going to work out. But what he really said is that I have to stand before you and I have to tell you who I am and what I'm really about. And um, I thought prayed about this subject for the last two weeks, and um, the things that came up in my thoughts and prayers, I said, I don't think that's what they want to hear. I don't really think that's what it's about. And everything that I was going to talk about happened in the service already. You've already heard the message, and it was amazing. And the capper was through this week, I have been singing, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, all week long, and she played it. <laughs> And it's like, okay, so here we go. Now, first of all, if you uh, don't know me, I am um, very much about theater. And I'm a Disney nerd, as you've already heard, I'm thinking in terms of Hunchback. But um, I'm also um, somebody who uh, isn't really comfortable in his own skin sometimes. And I hide behind that as an actor and as a performer. And you know, I believe that there is God in all of us. But our ego and our insecurity shatter those pieces of God. And sometimes we have to reflect those in a way that people understand. Well, when I read the scripture over, the two things that stood out to me, because remember David, the great theologian David, he says um, all about this scripture is the entire sermon. And I read the first two lines. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. For those of you who know me, 
That is so not who I am. <laughs> but I also believe that everyone reflects the body of Christ. Um, I did not want to be a minister. I didn't want to accept my call. And um, I'm already starting to tear up. This is part of me I don't like. But I, uh, I, I was prepared to turn it down. And I said, just when they asked me why, I said, well, you know, Moses got a burning bush. And I don't really feel that burning bush. <laughs> and I, I hate this. I hate this. But I drove up into my driveway one day. And there was a cardboard sign that had a bush on it. And it was on fire. <laughs> but there was also this profound moment. But in that profound moment, there was a squirrel. Oh, thank you. There was a squirrel with a stick and a marshmallow on it. <laughs> and he was roasting his marshmallow. And I remember that component more than I remember anything else. Because um, somebody said years ago in a sermon, I remember stories, I don't remember facts. But somebody said in a sermon once that God is in the interruptions. I plan my day very carefully. I have a schedule, I have a list of things that I need to accomplish, and when I'm the happiest, I'm clicking down the list, and the most incredible thing in the world is to go check, check, and that one's done, and I'm ready to go. Well, I work for the Renaissance Festival, and we run from one fire to the next. That's the way my job works, and I, it, it makes me crazy sometimes. But I also have the privilege of working with some of the most incredible human beings in the world. They're not all Christian, but many of them, most of them, are spiritual in their own way. And some of the most beautiful people I know are pagan and not Christian. But they have the same beliefs that we have. And it took me a lot. It used to scare me. Paganism used to really scare me. And I had a, uh, a young girl once who was, we were talking about it. It was late one night and we had just finished rehearsal. And she said to me, you know, it's like your God is split into so many pieces and we just celebrate each piece of him. Well, that's what happens in this body of Christ. We're celebrating pieces of him. Um, the Romani have something called Sandal Camp. And it is the toughest four days that my Romani face. Because they're running constantly, they're dancing constantly, they're running their characters. They have to be in character the entire time. And I'm, I am completely um, unrelentless about staying in character and keeping your dialect going and all of those things. And I don't know about you, but running has not been anything I've ever done. I didn't get old and look like this. This is how I've looked all my life. <laughs> and uh, I've not been a runner. And so I'm expecting them to do things that I can't do. And they have to form a team and they have to run. And the reflection that I see when I have fast runners, they'll start out in there, they're in front of the line, and they're running ahead. And then I have the little girl, or the little boy in the back, who's a little overweight, and he's limping along. And I'm in, I'm in the van behind, because I have to pick up the people who fall out. I'm in, I'm in the van behind, following them along. But I see the people in the front fall back. And they watch over the people who aren't quite making it. I mean, that woman, her name is Nora, and she is the best dancer and the best runner. She's, she sees the package, but she's the one who comes in the back and encourages them along. Um, like life, this is not a timed race. This is a accomplishment. You have to get through the run. And it's not just one run, guys. It's morning and evening, and it's every day. And, and the run gets longer and longer and longer. Kind of like life. But um, the last day, they're exhausted. 
they're on their emotional edge. And so am I, because trust me, it is not easy to lead the crew. But I watch them gather on the street. And they're, they're running in place. And finally, the last person arrives. And together, they run the last leg as a unit. And that's when I know, that's when I know that they're going to be a team at the Renaissance Festival. Because when you have thousands of people at you all the time, the pressure is huge, and you have to remain in character, you have to make sure that the audience is having a good time, and you have to be accessible. And yet, you still have to be a team, and you got to keep the show going. And that, in itself, for me, is a reflection of what God expects of me. Even, even when things are going wrong, I'm expected to keep things going and to keep my life working and my world working and hopefully touch people in a way that they understand my belief system and the love that I have for people. Um, sometimes that's hard. Uh, coronation, as I said, is the most stressful time in my world and I have very little time to do it. I'm doing a full one-act play and I get to block it and run it twice. Uh-oh, David. When this happened when I was a uh, pilot, I threw it on the ground, and I got yelled at, so I'm not going to throw it on the ground. <laughs> I'll lay it here and see what happens. Can you still hear me all right? All right. So, um, I have no idea what I just said because I just lost it, but we'll move on. Coronation. Coronation is um, lots of pressure, and I have a script, and usually I'm not tied to a script. Usually I get to choose, but coronation is a really difficult script. There are tons of words, and people, and everybody has an expectation of this event because it's meant to touch everybody. And Portia Bowers was kind enough to be one of my readers. Well, um, I think she thought, well, that's going to be a really cool thing. Well, uh, it's hard work. It's really hard work, was it not? It's really hard work because you've got lots of hard words to say, you've got to get them in at a certain time, and I'm not patient when they're not there because I have so many things coming down on me. And the music didn't work the way I wanted, and we kept adjusting, and I come in with this grand picture, and then I'm trying to make the picture work as best I can. And I have, I have to give in a little bit. How many of you had to give in to things that you didn't want to give in to? i got to give in a little bit. And you know what? Once I start giving and trying things, that's when it starts to work. When I'm struggling with it, and Adora, who I spoke of earlier, apparently said the next day when I came back a little less stressed, she goes, oh, thank God he's in a good mood today. <laughs> but um, the, I was lucky because the people who were dealing with it, Scott, by the way, is sitting in the audience, and he is our king. And um, Scott's brand new. That's why there's a coordination. And he's learning. He's growing too, just like we're growing as Christians every day. He's growing as king. Down to how far he has to set his feet apart to look powerful. And whether or not his hands are here or here make a difference in how his character looks. It also makes a difference in our world, how we present ourselves to others. And on Friday night, when I was trying to block things done, I'm not happy with how I presented myself. And... I'm lucky enough to have people who will forgive me and love me no matter what happens. And I have that in my life, and I hope that others have that too. And so perhaps you should share that with people around you, how much you love them and appreciate them. Because on Saturday afternoon, I was so tired I wanted to cry. I saw our king walk down the aisle, and the... <laughs> The organ and the trumpets. Oh, by the way, the trumpets didn't show up for you. I didn't really have a stroke. <laughs> and I could always depend on Pam, who's going to film no matter what. And the trumpets and the organ and everything was so beautiful and it gave me goosebumps. I have a friend who calls those God bumps. It was pretty incredible. And then, as things go, we got to reception and things are rolling and I'm, my spirit is high and everything's good. And then a woman fell. And I found out at that moment that that facility was not prepared to have an accident in that uh, facility, and it suddenly became our job to deal. But it's also our job to deal in a way that the audience doesn't see. Well, 
she actually fell at the very front of the room. <laughs> so that made it even harder. But my, my court, my king, went, oh, we have to shift the focus. He completely began singing and drew focus to bring her bed in right where she fell. And he completely shifted the focus and he made it happen. That's teamwork. While I was trying to figure out how we were going to deal with this woman and not make a huge scene, Scott knew it was his job already to get the focus somewhere else. I'm lucky. I have a support team who supports me 100%. Even when I'm, at, even when I'm stressing and I'm mean, they're still there. And I know that they're there. But I need to remember and I need to grow and I need to take more time to thank them and to love them and to help them know that um, I'm there for them. When, they, when she played the song, We Are One in the Spirit, We Are One in the Lord, that's how I feel about everyone in my world. And we try really hard. And I wish, to, I wish I could say that we were always one in the spirit, that we always agreed, but we don't. Sometimes we disagree. And I work with people who are passionate and loud, and sometimes they disagree really loudly, and I have to back off and remember that they're entitled to their opinion too. Sometimes I'm in charge and I have to say that this is what's going to happen. But I still have to love them through it. I have a woman who's incredibly talented who brings us so much music and so much that I can't offer as a human being. And boy, she can stress me out faster than any human I know. And yet, and yet, I know that she did it because she wanted to help. Because she could bring something that she knew I couldn't. And allowing her to support me, even when she pushes my buttons and makes me feel less. I always say that we're the best of friends when I'm okay with myself, but when I'm not, then we have problems. But we need to remember that we're not always the best of who we are. And sometimes we have to support people even when they're hard to support. And those aren't just people in church, those are people everywhere in our lives. There's something in Disney called random acts of pixie dust. And I love that. And they are simple things. And I think when it really comes down to it, I'm a really simple guy. I like to create big and grandiose things on stage. But the bottom line is a pretty simple human being. And random acts of pixie dust are moments that you can do that raise somebody else's spirits. Um, you receive balloons in um, Disney, you don't receive them. You pay for them, and you pay large dollars for them. But they last two weeks, but guess what? You can't take a balloon on uh, the plane. So it's got to go somewhere. It's got to be given up. And they, make, they talk about the kinds of responses that happen when the child hands over their balloon to another child. And that in itself is such an outpouring of love. And for me, that is definitely a random act of pixie dust. Uh, this morning, Ruth and I went to breakfast, tried to keep it as normal as possible this morning because I was about to, in the words of my granddaughter, get freaked out. <laughs> She's, Papa, you're freaking me out. Well, this almost freaked me out. But we went to breakfast at Hardy's this morning, and this couple was coming out the door. And I opened the door. She was struggling with it for a moment. And I opened the door, and she walked through. And then the man said to Ruth Ann, it's your turn. And he would, and I said, it's your turn. And that little moment, that little interaction with a stranger really lifted my heart. I can't tell you how many people slam the door in your face as they walk through. But it was an interaction. It was playful. It was fun. And it just felt good. And sometimes doing things for others just feel good. And it raises your spirit. Um, I've already talked too much, so I'm going to tell you one la about one last thing, and then I'm going to uh, let you have communion. And that is this. We, uh, uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are Disney podcasts, and um, there is a group called Be Our Guest, and they support an organization called, let's see if I can do this, Give Kids the World. And um, Give Kids the World is an amazing organization, because what they do 
they bring down handicapped children and their families, and they have a facility so well equipped that they are that they can make sick children and their families feel normal. They get to ride everything. And Disney supports them by giving them tickets to the park. But they do incredible things like, well, some of these kids don't know if they're gonna see their birthday. Some of these kids don't know if they're gonna see Christmas. And on one day, they celebrate birthdays, just like we did today. And on one day, they celebrate Christmas. And my favorite day is ice cream for breakfast day. And they make sure that there's ice cream that everybody can have. And you know that there is a percentage of those children who get better because for a week, they don't feel sick. They don't deal with doctors. They don't deal with nurses. Sorry. <laughs> but they, they are allowed to feel normal. And 1% of those people actually recover even when they didn't think they were going to get to. Um, I am hoping that one day in my Disney trip this, this year that I can figure out how to volunteer there. Um, the guy who they interviewed on the radio, or on the podcast, said it was the coolest thing ever. They have a train. This is so mean. They have a train, and the train allows wheelchairs on, and you get to drive the train around the park, because apparently it's that big. It's like Disney World in itself. It's got a park. And you drive the train around, and you let the kids laugh, and you get them to play. And he said, and I forgot that I was doing something for somebody else because my heart was so lifted that I found joy. Well, I challenge you. All of us can't go to give kids the world, but you can find a way this week to give joy to somebody else. And I promise you, um, I'm still reeling under Dave's math about how, you know, this birthday equates to it's, it's Dave. Well, I challenge you to make it about somebody else. And um, I promise that joy given multiplies and joy is always received. Now, I warn you because I tell the people, my actors at the Renaissance Festival, sometimes the joy you offer got internalized, but they didn't respond on the outside the way you wanted them to. There have been several times, um, my job is to be the person who flirts and plays, and I only flirt and play with older women. People who really appreciate it are secure in their world, but sometimes they are. But you know what? I know. I know for a fact that they went home and they talked about that. And it meant something to them. So remember, just because you didn't get the response you want doesn't mean that you didn't touch somebody's world. So I challenge you today to find a way this week to touch somebody's world and help us to bring together that body of Christ. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with my knowledge.